morning this is white raptor news ministries how is everybody doing it's 7 19 in the a.m december 30th temperature outside is 43 degrees hope everybody's having a blessed day it's funny how these things show up i would have liked to have had this to post on my video before christmas but i guess uh there's a saying out there that's better than better late than never so Let's enjoy the truth about the origin of Christmas and uh, the Roman sex cult and human sacrifice that's designed behind this holiday that we call Christmas. All praise and glory goes out to the Supreme Spirit, man. Ask him for the truth and ask him for his shield of protection. It can come from nothing else. Man can't save you. Peace. It has been called the Day of Days. It is a time of magic, pageantry, warmth, generosity, and love. For many of us, our fondest childhood memories revolve around the traditions of Christmas. It is a time that many around the world celebrate as the birth of Jesus Christ, the Savior and Messiah of mankind. Bye. In recent years, however, the spiritual holiday has become a time of mass marketing and crass commercialism. Incredibly, Many businesses derive more than half their yearly income during this period. Wow. The process of gift giving, once thought to have come from the story of the wise men who offered gifts to the newborn Christ, has evolved into the buying frenzy we see today during the month of December. Commercialized Christmas. But what about the other Christmas traditions? Have you ever wondered why we decorate the Christmas tree? Why we light the Yule log? Why we hang the mistletoe? and why we teach our children to believe in Santa Claus. In the Dumb. next hour, you will discover the true origins of Christmas. You may be surprised or even shocked to learn the source of your favorite holiday traditions. Chances are, you'll never look at Christmas the same ever again. I have come home and I have stood at the base of the... Sorry about that. You see, my channel doesn't allow... Uh, commercials because I think if you're talking about God or anything like that nothing from this world should be attached to it so let's begin Hemisphere during late December, the days are at their shortest lengths and the nights are at their longest. For those of the pagan world, this has always been the greatest time of the year to celebrate and practice the works of darkness. The pagan calendar identifies this period as the winter solstice. It was during the pre Christian midwinter pagan celebrations of Scandinavia's Norsemen where today's Christmas traditions began. As a means of honoring the pagan sex and fertility god Yule, a 12-day celebration during the month of December was inaugurated. A large single log considered to be a phallic idol was lit on fire and kept burning for 12 days. Animal or human sacrifices were offered in the fire on each of those <laughs> days. Wild, delirious reveling accompanied the daily sacrifices as drunken participants defiantly strove to make contact with spirits. A thousand miles away in pre-Christian Rome, celebrants were paying homage to their own gods during the winter solstice. Witchcraft traditions hold that a number of pagan gods were given birth during this period, including Dionysus, Attis, and Baal, chief male god of fertility and licentiousness. Santa Claus hat right there. Another pagan god from Persia, identified as Mithra, was said to have been born specifically on December 25th. Mithra was the god of the unconquerable sun, the god of the light between heaven and earth. Is there a connection Worshipped there? Worshipped at that time by an influential Roman cult. His birth symbolized an end to the long nights and a return to the dominance of the sun. During the month-long winter solstice celebration, courts in Rome were closed. Any and all crimes were allowed. Homosexuality, cross-dressing, and uncontrolled debauchery reigned supreme. Rome's order was turned upside down. 
Even children were allowed to join in the drunken orgies as part of the Juvenalia celebration. By 270 AD, the Roman Emperor Aurelian had made it official, setting aside a seven-day period from December the 17th through the 24th, culminating in an exchange of gifts on December the 25th to celebrate the birth of the sun god. This Roman orgy to end all orgies later became known as Saturnalia, in honor of the god Saturn, the god of excess. Roman soldiers invading Britain brought with them their pagan orgiistic traditions. Upon taking root in England, Saturnalia became known as the Festival of Fools reigned over by the Lord of Misrule. By the 4th century, the influential government-sanctioned Church of Rome, unable to outlaw the growing number of pagan practices, chose instead to adopt them into their so-called official Christianity. The church believed this would attract more pagans to their fold. Up until this time, the birthday of Jesus Christ, the Jewish Messiah, had not been celebrated at all. Ignoring scriptures, however, indicating that the birth probably did not occur during the winter, the church nevertheless confused biblical history and made Jesus' birthday coincide with the pagan god Mithra. What? The birth date of the sun god had now become the birth date of the Son of God. Hmm. It was hoped that the pagan celebrations of Saturnalia would merge into this new legally sanctioned form of Christianity. The church's practice of changing the dates of Christian events to coincide with pagan festivals continued, and by the 7th century, Pope Gregory I had ordered Augustine of Canterbury to incorporate any and all pagan practices and customs into the expanding Roman Catholic Church. During the Middle Ages, the debased Mardi Gras atmosphere of what was now known as Christ's Mass had reached a fevered pitch. Common practices included open sex in the streets, rioting, murder, and a number of pagan druidic Halloween rituals. Which they continue this today. This drenched celebration got so out of hand that by 1652, following the execution of King Charles I, Christ's Mass was finally out <coughs> in England. A religious reform movement began sweeping the country, led by Puritan Oliver Cromwell. The Puritans took the biblical mandate seriously, which commanded that Christianity remain pure and separate from paganism. Despite their noble efforts, the celebration simply went underground, and by 1656, after only four short years under the ban, the public's demand for the legalization of Christ's Mass had become insurmountable. The appointment of Charles II to the throne restored England's monarchy and with it the celebration of Christ's Mass. The Puritans had lost England, but they held high hopes for the new world. Puritans. When the first settlers came from England, uh, they were, for the most part, Puritans. They came here for religious freedom. They came here to be free to worship God without a hierarchy and without the corruption of the organized church that they had known before. And uh, when they came, they came with the clear knowledge of the danger of these pagan practices that had become so dear to the hearts of uh, their ancestors. Following England's lead Evil. in 1659, the colonies of America had likewise outlawed Christmas. For 200 years, the clergy in New England battled to keep the riotous celebrations honoring the pagan god Saturn from infiltrating the New World. The Reverend Cotton Mather had warned in a Christmas Day sermon in 1712, Can you in your conscience think that your Holy Savior is honored by hard drinking, lewd reveling, and by a mass fit for none but Borcus or Saturn? But the public's taste for sin and revelry persisted. In 1828, gang rioting during the Saturnalia-like Christmas celebrations got so bad that cities such as New York were forced to institute a professional police force for the first time in order to control the savagery. Christmas was not only not widely celebrated, in many cases, uh, many places, Christmas celebrations were actually outlawed. And this was because of uh, the attitude of many of the churches who regarded it as primarily as a pagan celebration and as a reproach to the Lord. By the mid-19th century, 
American churches were the last remaining holdout in the war against the validation of Christmas. However, they too finally succumbed as a result of the efforts of the American Sunday School Society, who began advocating Christmas programs for children as a method of filling the pews. The society argued that children could be taught about the birth of Christ through the reenactment of the nativity. They also offered... Today's tradition of the Christmas Yule Log stems directly from the worship of the pre-Christian Scandinavian fertility god Yule. The burning of this phallic idol is also responsible for the concept of the 12 days of Christmas, which represented the 12 daily sacrifices offered up in the Yule Log's flames. Another uh, good example of the um, pagan elements of Christmas is the whole concept of Yule and the Yule Log, the, uh, the very term is derived from uh, uh, the Norse god Yule, spelled J-U-L. And uh, uh, every year around Christmas time, uh, a huge log was uh, uh, cut down and uh, fashioned into a uh, fertility symbol and then burned uh, for 12 days. And on each successive day, a, a, a new sacrifice to the god Yule was performed uh, uh, in the fire, and a new sacrificial victim was uh, was burned to death. Uh, sometimes, but not always, these sacrificial victims were uh, human beings. And the whole uh, notion of the 12 days of Christmas also comes to us from this uh, Norse pagan tradition. In an attempt to blur the origins of this horrific ritual, the Church of Rome placed the first day of the Mass of Christ on December 25th, and the 12th day on January the 6th. Despite no scriptural references for January the 6th, it was selected as the day the wise men supposedly arrived to offer gifts to the newborn Christ. This day then has become known as Epiphany. During the Dark Ages, the European custom of putting an oil-lighted wick lamp in the windows during the 12 days of Christmas signified to neighbors that the occupants were participating in the pagan worship of the phallic idol Yule. In today's commercialism, this is where we get the tradition of decorating our houses with Christmas lights. The Yule log custom was originally brought over to America by Scandinavian immigrants during the 1600s. And despite attempts to ban the tradition, it has stayed with us to this very day. Today, when we wish someone Yuletide greetings, we are, in a sense, invoking the power of the fertility god Yule upon that person. During the Saturnalia celebrations, holly and other greens were hung over doorways as part of a pagan ritual to ward off evil. To deck the halls with boughs of holly was to acknowledge the powers of the nature gods. According to Wiccan rituals, placing holly or other greens in the shape of a circle or wreath accentuated its magical power. Similarly, mistletoe, when used in the casting of Wiccan or Druidic spells, could render a woman helpless and open to sexual exploitation. This is where we get our custom of hanging mistletoe in doorways today, and if a woman is caught underneath, she may be kissed and must not resist. The fir tree, uh, the mistletoe, uh, all of these things uh, typically uh, are come from uh, uh, overtly uh, pagan traditions, uh, in, typically in, from Northern Europe, German, Norse, and uh, English. Likewise, evergreen trees have always represented sex and fertility in pagan cultures. During the winter solstice, trees would be chopped down, brought inside, set up, and decorated as idols for worship. I'm going to stop right there. I want to show you something real quick. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 4, Bible Hub. I think that's right. I think she just said that. They adorn it with silver and gold and fasten it with hammer and nails so that it will not totter. They're specifically talking about a Christmas tree here. For the customs of the people are worthless. The customs of Christians, the customs of Hindus, the customs of Chinese, Japanese, South Korean, North Koreans, 
The customs of the pagans are worthless. They cut down a tree from the forest, which is your Christmas tree. It is shaped with a chisel by the hands of a craftsman. Okay? They adorn it with silver and gold and fasten it with hammer and nails so that it will not totter. Like scarecrows in a cucumber patch, their idols cannot speak. Can Jesus speak? Is he speaking? No, he can't. He's just a man that's whittled out of a piece of wood across the cross. They must be carried. Jesus must be carried. They cannot walk. Jesus can't walk. Do not fear them. Do not fear Jesus. For they can do no harm. And neither can they do any good. So something. And also right here. Look. Okay. Here you have. If a man has committed a sin worthy of death. And he is executed. And you hang his body on a tree. You must not leave the body on the tree overnight. Jesus was hung from a tree by the way folks. He wasn't hung from a cross, the cross was the pagan ritual that was added. The Christmas tree was regarded uh, as a as a sacred tree. Uh, the, to uh, the to Satan, to the pagans, uh, typically uh, worshipped trees. They uh, regarded trees uh, and groves as sacred. So, uh, uh, the bringing of the uh, tree into the house would be a way of uh, bringing this uh, supernatural. Uh, source of blessing uh, into your home. That was that was the whole idea that there were there were spirits uh, who resided. In yeah, the evil in spirits, the ladies, man, because it's the pagan of worship. The winter solstice Christmas tree primarily took root in Germany. During his reign, King George the First, himself of German extraction, brought the custom to Victorian England. German immigrants settling in Pennsylvania did the same in America during the early 1800s. In 1848, the London Illustrated News published this famous engraving depicting Queen Victoria and her royal family beside a decorated Christmas tree. And within a few years, nearly every English household had their own tree in allegiance to the monarchy. By 1900, the US Forest Service estimated that at least one in five homes in America had adopted the Christmas tree tradition. Down. Thousands of years earlier, God, speaking through the prophet Jeremiah, warned against this pagan practice in the Old Testament. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the ways of the heathen, for the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, they deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers that it move not. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. I'm going to make a bold statement and say that doing a TEDx talk is going to be the most transformative and uplifting experience of your life and your business. This is Kevin. Before his TEDx talk, when I met him, he was 19 years old, had just dropped out of high school, was battling mental health issues, really hoped to one day write a book, and was an aspiring speaker. After helping him land his TEDx talk, he has now landed over 300 paid speaking engagements. He's landed a six-figure book deal with the world's largest publisher. He's helped raise millions of dollars for mental health charities and most importantly, he's living his purpose full time. I can keep going, but the point is a TEDx talk has the ability to transform your life, your business, and your impact. Sorry about that. I just stepped out to get a drink of water, man. They throw a fucking commercial on. Is another uh, good example of a pagan element of, of Christmas. Santa Claus, as we know him today, is a, uh, an amalgamation of several different traditions, but uh, in most anagram Saint throughout the world, Santa uh, Saint will find the existence of what is known as hearth gods, uh, gods who uh, guard uh, the hearth and the chimney and keep the fires burning and make sure the food cooks properly and the people are warm and what have you. And at a certain time of year, uh, in the middle of winter, typically, uh, the hearth god dressed in red will come down the chimney to reward those who uh, have pleased him during the course of the previous year and to uh, lay uh, curses or hexes or other forms of uh, uh, punishment upon uh, people who have displeased him. The concept of Santa Claus has had a long and winding history with a number of diverse cultures contributing to the composite character we have today. Beginning once again in Scandinavia, Santa's original incarnation was in the form of Odin, the pagan god of thunder. 
a tall fellow with a long flowing beard who inhabited the spirit-infested Nordic forests. Odin would travel the sky during the winter solstice deciding who would die and who would prosper. Most believers were frightened of this particular time of year. In England, Odin eventually evolved into Father Christmas, who, crowned with sprigs of holly, traveled to the countryside getting roaring drunk as part of the Festival of Fools celebration. Festival of Frequently, Fools. Frequently, he would be accompanied by a horned goat, ironically the biblical symbol of those who reject the salvation of Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> there you, why do they show a picture like that when they see Jesus Christ? ...from Myra in Asia Minor during the 4th century. He was known as the patron saint of seafaring men. Over the centuries, as the legend began to unfold, it was rumored that St. Nicholas had actually captured the devil himself, put him in chains, and made him his personal servant. Recognized How is that, man? Because the anagram for Santa is Satan, and we're taught that Santa comes down a chimney to the fire, right? I remember as a child looking at the fire, my dad lighting the fire New Year's night, the family over, everybody doing their thing, and then I would ask, how's Santa going to come down the fireplace when there's a fire, Right? Well, Santa is saint and they are connected, which also connects Jesus to the holiday. It connects Jesus and Satan together with one another. In various cultures as Krampus, Beelzebub, or Zwart Piet, Black Peter, this assistant of St. Nicholas is best known by his German name, Neft Ruprecht. Described as a hideous horned creature, the servant Ruprecht was a dark and sinister figure who stood in stark contrast to the saintly Nicholas. Somehow, Father Christmas's companion, the horned goat, had metamorphosized into the foreboding horned devil called Ruprecht. As St. Nicholas traveled from house also, to house... Also, the horned goat. What's that talking about? Huh? Isaiah chapter 34, verse 14, Bible Hub. I think that's the one. Okay, they're talking about goat demons. The desert creatures will meet with the hyenas and one wild goat will call to the other. Goats. What are the goats? The goats are Gentile. There the night creatures will settle and find for her place of repose. Who are they talking about her when they say that? You have to read a lot of these different variations, but they're talking about Lilith. Let's jump in here at the King James. The wild beast of the desert shall meet also meet with the wild beasts. The beasts are what? The wild beasts are those that are created on the, in Genesis. The wild beasts of the desert will also meet with the wild beasts of the islands meaning all the all lands okay gentile this is beast and the satire shall cry to his fellows the screech owl also shall rest there and find for herself a resting place there's one in here that gives it a name and the name that it gives it is lilith the creatures of the desert will encounter jackals and the hairy goat will call to its kind. The Gentile will call to one another. Indeed, Lilith, night demon, Lilith is a night demon, <coughs> will settle there and find herself a resting place. So when they talk about goats, they're specifically talking about a tribe of people or tribes or nations of people. Just to give you that. House, inquiring about the behavior of children, Ruprecht would drop candy and gifts down the chimney into the good children's shoes which had been placed there. It was from this story that we get our tradition of hanging stockings on the mantle at Christmas time. If able to recite a verse or demonstrate a skill for St. Nicholas, the child would receive a gift. If unable to remember a verse or if the child had been bad, he or she would receive a switch or a whip. 
Ruprecht also carried <laughs> a large sack which he would frequently use to haul away the really bad boys and girls. As more and more Christian churches <laughs> that began scare a child, right? <laughs> rituals of the winter solstice with the celebration of the birth of Christ, emphasis on St. Nicholas's role began to shift. Notice also, folks, that she said the birth of Christ, okay? Unto us a child is born, okay? That's 9, 6 of Isaiah. So Jesus was born, Jesus was sent, and Jesus was made lower than the angels. Jesus is fully man and fully God, but Jesus doesn't even know the day of his own return? Mm, yeah, sure you're right. Some cultures began to downplay the role of St. Nicholas, but surprisingly retained Ruprecht. I'm 65 and I don't look like myself anymore, do I? Ruprecht was made the companion and servant to the Christ child himself. In this scenario, the devil is actually given the title Venoxman or Santa Claus. Oh, what? The devil was given the name Santa Claus? Did I just make that connection for you right before that? Hmm, I sure did, because Santa is Satan. Theodore Storm, in his story about Necht Ruprecht, even goes so far as to describe the switches given to the children by Ruprecht as tools to be used in sadomasochistic rituals. Soon, the image of Ruprecht would fade from the Christmas tradition, but not his sadistic influence. Many of the early depictions of Santa Claus portrayed him not as a jolly gift giver, but of an unfriendly disciplinarian complete with a ready switch or whip. One of the problems with the mm, wonderful. Christmas gift thing for children is that it really is a religious teaching, a wrong religious teaching, because it teaches them that if they're nice, they get the gifts. If they're naughty, they don't. Or in my case, I was taught that he would leave us a bundle of switches. Uh, isn't that interesting? Uh, it's a salvation by uh, my own personal virtue. <laughs> but there's a second thing wrong with it, and that is that they're going to get those gifts whether they're naughty or nice, because most parents love their children and, and won't, wouldn't dream of quote, ruining their Christmas, and they're not going to ruin Christmas, they're going to give those children the gifts anyway, and some sooner or later those thinking children are going to realize, I wasn't very nice, but I got the gift anyway. So it isn't important to be nice, it isn't important to do what is right. Well, there's a lot of lies that are around Christmas, if you really look about it. Take the children in the lunch, taking a child in a grocery store line who's standing there just minding their own business, and, and the cashier throws a smile at the child and says, have you been a good boy this year? Have you been a good girl this year? Is Santa going to be, be bringing you presents and stuff? You see, the entire nation, understand this, the entire nation is in on a lie to the children about a fat man in a red suit, black belt, black boots, coming down a fire, chimney through the fire to bring you gifts whose anagram is Satan, which ties that into the birth of Jesus Christ. You people are, are worshiping the devil. Jesus is the devil. That's right, and avoid what is wrong. German immigrants coming to America during the 1620s tried to influence the New World with the stories of St. Nicholas and his gift-giving companion, Necht Ruprecht. But somehow the idea just didn't take hold until almost 200 years later. In 1819, America's best-selling author, Washington Irving, used his influence to promote St. Nicholas in a popular Christmas story titled Brace Bridge Hall. Consulting Irving's writings, Episcopalian minister Clement Clark Moore penned a decidedly secular tale called A Visit from St. Nicholas in 1822. Later retitled The Night Before Christmas, Moore's poem was based on the tales of German and Dutch immigrants who had come to America. Intended originally only for his own children, Moore's story was published in the Troy Sentinel in New York and became an overnight sensation. Gone were the bishop's remnant of St. Nicholas. He was now a jolly old elf imbued with supernatural powers. Moore had also replaced Nicholas's companion, the horned necked Ruprecht, with eight horned magical reindeer. As the popularity of the night before Christmas grew, Moore became increasingly concerned that the story's emphasis on the supernatural and its disregard for Christ would reflect poorly 
on his position as a minister. As a result, he refused to take credit for its creation until the story became so popular that he could no longer resist. Forty years later, illustrator Thomas Nast, political cartoonist for Harper's Weekly, seared the image of Santa Claus into the minds of the world by creating a drawing which combined Moore's jolly old elf with images of St. Nicholas the devil. in his own native Bavaria. By 1880, Santa was a thoroughly secularized folk hero who had become increasingly irresistible to retailers worldwide. One factor that has contributed to uh, the paganization of Christmas, the complete paganization of Christmas, has been the element of commercialism. Uh, it may seem odd to think of it in that context, but uh, remember that Christ himself identified the love of money as a spiritual force in and of itself. And where it comes into play, it has a kind of naturally hostile effect on, uh, on the gospel and the, uh, uh, the Christian faith. So the commercialization of Christmas has helped to highlight the pagan elements and to uh, drive the overtly Christian elements further underground. To me, the most obscene thing about Christmas celebrations and customs as we know them is that as a result of these things, Jesus is displaced in the hearts of children by Santa Claus. The love, affection, appreciation, trust. The, the but it's a lie. Santa Claus isn't real. This is part of the nature of why they teach you about something. And then later on, when you find out that Santa Claus doesn't exist, it almost rips your heart out to believe in anything that you can't see again. You see, if they taught us from the truth, from the very beginning of God, instead of this magical clown Santa Claus coming down a chimney, and we were taught about the supreme spirit of truth, the living God, then we'd have something more to hold on to rather than having the results of this fake Santa Claus that we've been taught about all our lives ripped from our understanding. It makes it so much more difficult for anybody to believe in something they can't see once they've had that, that notion of something that they can't see ripped from them. It's that easy. It's that simple to understand. The desire to emulate these things that they should have in their hearts and minds as growing children for Jesus himself, to whom they owe everything. Bullshit. Uh, you don't owe Jesus anything, man. Why do you feel that you owe Jesus something? What did Jesus ever do to you? What is Jesus waiting for? Hold on. I, w I thought that Jesus took the sins of the world with him to hell, man. And that all pain and sorrow and grief and torment and all that shit was going to be taken with him to hell. So if that's the case, then why is there still sin in the world? That would make Jesus a liar. Okay? It also makes Jesus a liar when he says that man, they, they were crucified between two men. He told the one that he would be with him that day in paradise. How could Jesus be with that man or that man be with Jesus that day in paradise when Jesus went to hell for three days? Huh? Did he just hang on the cross for three days? No, because a body has to come down off of the cross. So where did that spirit go with Jesus that Jesus promised him that he would be with him that day in paradise? See, these are Christian. These are questions that Christians can't answer. They'll, they'll tap dance around it. You ask this question, they'll go blank. They'll tell you you have to believe in faith. You just got to have faith. You just got to have hope. No, you got to have common sense. You got to have logic and you got to have reason. Okay? If logic, faith, logic and reason outweigh faith and hope, then you have to go with the common denominator, logic. Okay? Something, this realm that we live in has boundaries. It has rules. Okay? And those rules and boundaries can't be broken outside the physical realm of this spectrum that we live in. What do I mean by that? I mean that donkeys don't talk. I mean that wells don't swallow people and regurgitate them three days later. And I mean that eight people couldn't feed three million animals on an ark for a year. There's too many broken stories inside of this stuff. So the reality of this physical realm and the rules that are it's bound by, you got to start using common sense. These are fairy tale stories, folks. Okay? You need to wake up from that. Christianity is lying to you. Thomas Jefferson said himself, the third president of the United States said to us, 
that Christianity is the most perverse religion that ever shown on man. You should start listening to what your presidents are telling you. Instead, this has been stolen. This has been uh, raped out of their hearts, in a sense, and displaced by the myth of Santa Claus. He takes the place of God or of Jesus Christ in the special world that is Christmas. No, they're one and the same. Knowledge they're of, tied together. Uh, history, a supernatural knowledge of, uh, of your present, of your attitudes. He's keeping a list. He knows who's naughty and nice. Your parents don't even know that. Uh, he's obviously got some uh, some conduit to knowledge. That list that, that Santa Claus is keeping has nothing to do with the gifts, man. The list that Santa Claus is keeping, whether you've been naughty or nice, is the list uh, to the book of the lamb, the lamb of the book that you have the names of that are going to be given passage. If you're naughty, you're not given passage. And here's something else that you need to pay close attention to as well. That Jesus says, Jesus says here, man. But Jesus answered, is it written, man shall not live on bread alone? Give me one second. Sorry about that. That wasn't really the parable I was looking for. It was this one here. But Jesus answered, is it written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only? Jesus here is telling you to worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus isn't saying here it is written to worship me, your Lord. I am your God. I am your Savior. Worship me only. He's directly giving you uh, an order here to serve God only. And who's this God in the New Testament? I'll bet you it's a, a, a magistrate. Again, and what's a magistrate? A magistrate is a man right here. A magistrate is a divinity. D-I-V-I -I is to divide. It is a divided entity, a divinity. Figuratively, a magistrate, a judge, a politician, a shithead, a liar, a thief, a con, a, a, a conjurer. This, is, this God here is a theos. It's a deity God. It's, it's a... A supreme divinity. It is not the one divinity. It is not the supreme spirit of life, the living omnipotent force that moves all things in place. It is a man in a flesh suit claiming to be God. Real talk. That is uh, beyond the human, uh, and he, uh, he flies through the air. Uh, and Lies. Visiting every place on the globe in the course of a single night. In many, many ways, Santa exhibits supernatural qualities that uh, provide a kind of a surrogate deity or a substitute for uh, for God or for Christ. Myths, That's by what they did. definition, evolve and change, and things are added. Uh, we we used to have a Santa Claus figure uh, that was confused with Saint Nicholas and confused with other pagan figures, and then somehow. He evolved through the drawings of Thomas Nast and others into what we see today, but he had a sleigh with eight supernatural reindeer that can fly. And so the, the Christmas traditions that are pagan continue to change. But the truth of Jesus, the truth of the Incarnation, the truth that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, never changes, never will. Bullshit. I hope to God one day that it does change. Let me give you an idea what I'm talking about here. John chapter 1 verse 1 Bible 1. Bible hub. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. In the beginning. Remember Jesus is the beginning. Okay. In the beginning was the word. When you add the sum of the word it comes to 60. And when you add... 6 plus 0 is 6, and when you say the word three times in this parable, it is 666. This ties Jesus into the man of perdition. Jesus is the beginning. The beginning is time. It's a commencement of time. There's 60 seconds, 60 minutes, 24 hours in a day. 2 plus 4 is 6. That's 666. Jesus is the beginning. The beginning is the fall into this plane of existence. It's a beginning of time. The supreme creator has no beginning and has no end. So this tells you that Jesus is 666. Nobody tells it better. 
Makes me feel sad for the rest. Nobody tells it quite the way I do. Are you going to let the greedy he and companies and native? Various scriptures in the Bible, including the second chapter of Luke, record the events surrounding the birth of the Messiah. A decree from Caesar Augustus had gone out requiring all people to return to the city of their origin for taxation purposes. <laughs> Mary, who was pregnant with a child conceived by the Holy Spirit, made the difficult journey to Bethlehem along with her husband Joseph. Both Joseph and Mary were of the lineage of King David. Upon okay, folks, remember what I just said. Anything outside the laws of this physical world cannot happen. So the Supreme Spirit, the Creator, the self-existing Eternal One, didn't come upon anything in this plane of existence through an immaculate conception, all right? That never happened. That is a, a, a spell. It's a ghost spell that has been placed over you, okay? Anything out of the construction of this reality, and there are rules that you are bound by. Therefore, anything cannot just materialize in this plane of existence from the Holy Spirit. Just saying. Upon arrival, they found all the inns to be full, but were provided with a stable where Mary could have her baby. At the same time, an angel announcing the birth of the Messiah appeared to shepherds tending their flocks in a field nearby. The stunned shepherds hurried to Bethlehem and found the baby Jesus lying in a manger just as the angel had declared. Baby Jesus! All traditional nativity scenes placed three wise men at the stable at the time of Jesus Christ's birth. According to scripture, these wise men visited Jesus later at his home. Because three gifts are named, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, tradition says three men gave them. But exactly how many wise men visited Jesus is not known. The birth of Jesus Christ miraculously fulfilled a number of Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah, including that he would be born in Bethlehem, that he would be born of a virgin, and that he would be a descendant of King David's. The, the, concept the bright morning the star. Celebrating the birth of Jesus once a year had apparently never occurred to the church fathers. In the first three centuries of the church's history, there was no such thing. And I think God perhaps very carefully avoided telling us in the scriptures when he was born. We can be sure of one thing. It wasn't in late December. And That's uh, for sure. In the first place, shepherds don't abide by their flocks in the fields by night in late December. It's too cold. They yep. take them out in the morning to pasture, uh, uh, protect them while they eat all day, and then bring them back in at night. So it wasn't in late December. And remember, the calendar was the calendar then... Perhaps, it only it was a ten month calendar, okay. Julius Caesar and Augusta, two egotistical men, wrote the calendar, the Gregorian calendar, and put two extra months in the calendar. They just took time from each one of the other months. They were thirty three thirty three days, I believe, were uh, or thirty six days were in a, a month in the first calendar. I'm not absolutely one hundred percent sure on that. But I can look it up. I will search it up and, and find it out. Actually, a tantalizing thought to try to figure out when he was born. And it can be done uh, within limits. And uh, if it mattered, and apparently it doesn't matter to God. Well, if God was born, was born then, then that's a beginning. You get it? The Supreme Spirit, folks, stands outside of time, space, and matter. Okay? Doesn't exist. For it's the invisible world that makes up this world that we live in. Some scholars point out that according to scripture, the birth of Jesus may have taken place in the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles or September 29th. Ironically, this would have placed his conception right around December 25th. The timing of other events such as the temple service of Zacharias and the pregnancy of Mary's cousin Elizabeth lend credence to December 25th as being the date of Jesus' conception. Since Christians believe that life begins at conception anyway, and not at birth as pro-abortionists believe, this... See, Christians believe that life is at conception. So, 
That would probably be a devout Christian, maybe a, a, a Gnostic Christian, someone that believes in one God, because most Christians today are screaming in the sh streets, my, my choice, my body, my body, my choice. You know, if I want to have an abortion, then then uh, I can have an abortion. So I say to the same cause, if a woman wants to have a child and the man doesn't want to have the child, then why should the man be liable for that woman who's having a child? If, if it's a woman's right to have that child and she, she, she chooses herself to have that child when the man doesn't want to have the child, then why should the man be responsible for the child? Just think about that. Yeah. This may be a more appropriate reason to remember this time of the year as the period in which God came to earth in human form. No, that's to a some, lie. Christmas today simply means... That's a lie. God never came to this earth in human form. Show you right here. Numbers chapter 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie. God is not a man. So if Jesus is God and he came in flesh, then that's a contradiction. I don't care how you say it. See, anybody who tells you that the Bible isn't doesn't have contradictions in it is the devil. Don't listen to them. Run from anyone who tells you that the Bible is infallible. It's been written over and over and over. There's over fucking 350 different copies of the Bible written in different ways, in different texts. So if you have all these different texts, all these different Bibles, then you know that it's a copy of a copy of a copy and it's not the original text. Okay, this book is not the elite book that was once written perfect from the Hebrew. It's a jacked up Bible because the children of God turned from him and started this kind of per worship, this pagan worship. This is why you're under punishment because the spirit told you through the commands of a, a man not to enter the cities of the Samaritans or the towns of the evil pagans. And that's what you've done. And that's what we've been doing. We've been crossbreeding and breeding out Nephilim ever since. It means a time to get together as a family. For pagans, it is a deeply religious time to celebrate the winter solstice. Retailers, of course, view it with eyes towards making stupid ass points. shit, man. Others use this time to reflect on the birth or conception of Jesus Christ, while many parents use Christmas to perpetuate the myth of Santa Claus to their children. In order to carry on this myth of Santa Claus, we must lie to our children. We must deceive them. We literally must lie to our children. To our children, one of the wonderful things about children is that they naturally believe everything that we tell them when they're small. That's because they're connected spiritually. They're not living in the fucking flesh like adults are and stuff. They're connected to the God brain. They're spiritual children. All right? It's not until the ego comes into play that children start, you know, going their own way. The minute a child says mine or give me or any of that shit or tells you no, that's the ego mind coming into effect. That's the falling away. As soon as you fall into the ego, that is the falling away from God. You can have no ego and um, achieve the higher mind of the spirit. You have to come to the supreme spirit humble because you've fallen away from him. tell them the truth and if we deceive them in this way it has to be destructive because at no some point shit in their future lives they're going to wonder if other things we told them were true right the things we told them about the lord were they really true right plant no seeds of doubt and anyway it exactly disappointment it creates disillusionment in right my mind the question is not so much whether to celebrate christmas or even how to celebrate christmas but to be able to make any decision knowledgeably. Whether you celebrate it or you don't celebrate it, you should know why you're doing so. Exactly. I don't celebrate Christmas. Are, and with that knowledge, I quit. you can discount them or ignore them if you choose to do so. It is not the purpose of this film to tell you which Christmas rituals should and should not be practiced by you and your family. This is between you and the Lord. What Christians should be most concerned about, however, 
are the growing pagan influences infiltrating every area of our rapidly degenerating society. Paris. Rapidly you know degenerating. Five universities like Harvard, Sorry about Florida, that. Columbia don't even require as Recently, we took our cameras to the Nevada desert where we witnessed 35,000 pagans from around the country participating in a week-long celebration of sex, drugs, and hedonism. Here, everything was permissible and encouraged, except for the adoration of Jesus Christ. In nearly every ritual performed, Christianity was mercilessly mocked and despised. Each year, the numbers of participants continues to grow. Its attraction is expanding worldwide as it recruits through the internet. It Seriously, what needs to be done, like, in this group of people right here is like one of those little fucking scud missiles dropped right in the fucking center of it and every one of them fucking wiped out this is evil folks you understand that you can't look at that and see that these people are evil i know you don't understand the concept of what it means when god created evil on the sixth day of creation okay People that rape children, this is the kind of people that are hanging out at this stuff. These are pedophiles, these are rapists, they're murderers, they're fornicators, they're liars, they're cheaters, they're, they're, they're self-indulgent pigs, is what they are. It is sobering to witness what could be the wave of the future unfolding before our eyes. I'd hope not. It is not only permitted uh, in the public schools, in the government schools, to celebrate holidays. It is encouraged and in some uh, instances required, but with this, with this uh, uh, condition, they must be pagan. They must not be Christian. And Christmas time, they are, they are certainly encouraged to put on Christmas programs and Christmas plays, uh, but all references to Jesus, all references to the gospel, all references to the incarnation, all references to God must be omitted. They sing about Santa Claus, they sing about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, God only knows what else they sing about that is in scriptural. Since the pagan elements in Christmas are so strong, and they provide virtually the, the entirety of the structure and the content of the holiday, there is no Christian element in the holiday. Therefore, uh, it becomes the ideal uh, politically correct, culturally diverse, uh, multicultural holiday uh, for, for everyone. In the 17th chapter of John, Jesus taught that it was appropriate for his followers to be in the world, but not of the world, meaning that we should be involved in our world so as to have a positive influence, but not become corrupted by it. The mighty Joshua, in challenging his people, said, Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth. True. And put away the other gods which your fathers served. Choose you this day whom ye will serve. The spirit of truth. Me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The Creator. Rather than setting aside a few days of the year to remember the Lord, Christians should live with a day by day, moment by moment dedication of their entire lives to Jesus Christ. Bullshit. Then and only then. That's a lie, man. Okay? Jesus is 666, folks. Okay, Jesus is the pagan worship. He's a whittled man out of wood. He died. Jesus is surrounded by death. Don't listen to these garbage. These people here are all going to be met with hellfire. Okay, their immortality is going to be on this fucking shithole. Their eternal life, man, born over and over into this incarnated life as this plane of existence continues to degrade be able to have victory over pagan influences and to have an impact on society for God the creator. Yeah, so you're going to tell me that by worshiping Jesus, who, who is a whittled piece of wood, which is also pagan worship, I'm going to close out and show you real quick with a few parables here. If you've watched this far, 1 Colossians 1.15 the Son, Jesus Christ, this is who we're talking about, is the image of the invisible God. How can Jesus be the image of something that is invisible and can't be seen? Also, this God tells you no one can see his face and live. So how can you see Jesus Christ? That's another contradiction. If this God is saying that no one can see his face and live, how are you looking at Jesus Christ as God, looking at Jesus' face 
and live because you're not alive. You are the walking dead. It's you. They're not mocking you with Jesus. I mean, they're not mocking Jesus. They're mocking you that worship Jesus. Jesus is the God of this realm and, and it's all evil. These people are not mocking Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the God of the dead. You got to understand that. For the Son is the image of the invisible God. Well, who's the one that's created in an image? Genesis 127 Bible Hub. So God created man in his own image. Okay, this man that's created on the sixth day of creation was created one man, himself, a male and female. This God here, which is Elohim, created, a, this God is a plural of Eloah, which is God's in the ordinary sense, but specifically used. This God is used of the Supreme God. This God here is not the Supreme God. This God here create, was permitted, right here, Revelations 13, 15 Bible Hub. We're talking about a beast, the beast from the earth. The second beast was permitted to give breath to the image of the first beast. Who are the first beast? Genesis 1, Who is the second beast? Genesis 1, and 27. Which says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image. So this God is creating something in an image. And an image is a phantom. And the noun and definition for phantom is a ghost. And a ghost's definition is the spirit of the dead. So this man that's created in an image of God, who is Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is the firstborn over all creation. Right here, Jesus, the Son, Jesus is the image. Jesus is the image. Jesus is the image. Jesus is the image. How many times do I got to say it to you that Jesus Christ is the image? It's telling you that Jesus is the image. And an image is the spirit of the dead. The one that's created in an image of God here is an idol. And it's telling you that Jesus is the image. If you turn from lessons like this, you turn from this truth, you refuse to hear it. I'm afraid that your immortal life will not be as blessed as you think it will. In order to find true salvation, you must turn from this world. She said that, the, uh, that look, John chapter 3, verse 16, Bible Hub. For God, this God again, who so loved the world, this is a magistrate, which is a man. This God is a theos, 216, a divinity, figuratively a magistrate, which is a judge for the God so loved the world, mankind, this God here is mankind, so love, it's mankind that loves this world, okay, the living God, the supreme spirit of God doesn't love this world, he tells you right here, those that love the world are at enmity with God, do not love the world or anything in the world, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. The love of the true spirit is not in them. So, folks, it's time to wake up and know the truth. This is White Raptor News Ministries. Blessings to all the children who turn back to the Supreme Spirit. Peace.